What about Casey DeSmith? Why don't we ever talk about Casey DeSmith? We didn't even talk about Casey DeSmith when he was still Casey DeSmith. Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Penguins. Comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer up Daily Shots of Steelers and Pirates right where you found this. Every discussion, it seems, that we have related to the one greatest shortcoming on this roster. I think we can mostly agree on that, right? Has been about Tristan Jari. It's always about Jari. It's always about the number one guy and whether or not he can be the number one guy. Whether or not the number one guy can get it done in the number one game of the playoffs once they get started. And I I understand that. I get that. You look around the NHL and you see especially those teams that get deeper, that it's a number one guy who gets it done. But that's not always the case. That's not always the case. And increasingly, you've seen teams rely more on a true tandem to get the job done, even in the playoffs, not just Vegas. I mean, that was the big outlier, with the way that Peter DeBoer handled Robin Leonard and Mark andre Fleury, and it got everybody's attention, probably more than any other like scenario since the Penguins had their own issue sorting between Matt Murray and Fleury. But there are teams that go with true tandems. Think about what the Bruins did over the past couple of years with Tuka Rask and Yaroslav Halak. Both older guys, maybe a different dynamic there, but a tandem, no less. And yet, when we think of the Penguins, even though Jari and DeSmith pretty much skated into last season as a tandem, we ended up viewing it as jarry or bust. And yes, of course, I'm aware and was there whenever DeSmith got hurt at that practice and you knew it was bad right away with the way he went off, ripping up that groin. What we couldn't have known is how much he'd be missed. We couldn't have known how big a role he could have played if he'd been healthy and been available. We couldn't have known how quickly Mike Sullivan would have pulled the trigger on Jari, you know, where he'd just seen enough. All of that would have been fascinating to watch unfold. All of it, that said, is a hypothetical. So what might be more interesting is moving forward, what would it take to change the collective perception, not even necessarily on the inside with the Penguins, but maybe more so on the outside with people like you and me, that would get us past this notion that DeSmith can't be that guy, or at least can't be part of a winning tandem in the playoffs. This portion of Daily Shot of Penguins is brought to you by The good people at the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank, where they're committed to providing food for all of our neighbors in need across western Pennsylvania. Visit pittsburghfoodbank.org to find out how you can be a part of that. Once more, it's Pittsburgh Food Bank. Spell all three of those words out. Dot org. DeSmith had stretches last season where he was the Penguins' number one. Again, another thing I feel like it's been forgotten. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Not only did he start fairly regularly, finishing up with an 11-7 record, but he also had a 2.54 goals against, a 9-12 save percentage, two shutouts, He participated in four total shutouts. 
couple of those were against the Bruins and the Capitals. Good teams. He wasn't being hidden. There was a stretch near the end of the season, you'll recall, where he pretty much carried the Penguins for a couple of weeks. And it wasn't until the very last of that stretch, the last game of that stretch, where he got he got pummeled pretty good. The Penguins weren't any good in front of him either, but he you could tell it was kind of like a, a Cinderella effect where he was due to expire. Or maybe that was just our perception of him. Maybe that's just us thinking, you know, he, he's not very good, and when he is good, it's just because he's really battling hard and he's competing and all that other stuff that Sullivan tends to praise him for. I'll tell you what mine is, what my perception is, why I so often ignore DeSmith when I'm discussing the Penguins goaltending. And this is going to sound really lame, but I'm just going to be honest with you. I see him as a just a smaller guy at a position where you've seen gradually the players get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, they're not all Mike Smith and Andre Vasilevsky and Devin Dubnik and the real giants of the game, but they're bigger guys. And there's Casey DeSmith. He's got modest size to him. He's not tiny. He's six feet tall. That's the size that Johan Hedberg was when he was in. And they actually have a lot of similarities, including their style, even their personalities to an extent. DeSmith and Moose. But it's something that holds you back in the modern NHL. It's not unthinkable to succeed with a smaller goalie today. It's also not unthinkable to see a smaller goalie get hot in the playoffs and do some good things for his team. One, uh, got one guy that jumps out is Alex Nedeljkovic of the Hurricanes. If you followed what Carolina did in the playoffs, they ended up really against it with their goaltending. And actually, they've been like that for years now, it seems, where they could just never keep their main guy healthy or have a main guy. But they do find somebody that they trust who can get hot, and that's what Nedeljkovic did for them. He he, he looks like an AHL goalie. He spent most of his professional career in the AHL. And as soon as you see him standing in the crease, that's what you're thinking. AHL goalie. And I do the same thing. I do the same thing when DeSmith is playing. No matter how well he's playing, no matter what kind of role he's on, they're singing the anthem and I'm looking down from the press box and I see him in the crease and I think AHL goalie. Maybe that's fair. Maybe that isn't. Maybe, maybe he could be that guy who bails out Jari when it's needed. Maybe he can be that guy who, if Jari finishes the season on some kind of down note and the rest of the team seems to respond better to DeSmith in goal, they can decide to go with DeSmith in game one. And listen, I, I can feel the vibe here. You're not excited about this. I'm not excited about this. I wouldn't imagine that the Penguins are. But I know this, and I'm not guessing at this when I share this with you. Mike Sullivan, specifically talking about one person here, Mike Sullivan believes in DeSmith. And I know that's going to sound like a convenient thing to say, because, hey, if Sullivan really believed in DeSmith, why would he ever have Tristan Jari anointed at his num as his number one guy and all that other stuff? And, and I get that. Jari has top-round talent. He has, you know, he was a second-round pick, but, you know, for, for a goaltender, that can be equated to a first-rounder considering how few of them get taken early on in any draft. He has that type of talent. He has that size. He has that athleticism. But what he doesn't have, 
and we've seen this way too often, is he doesn't have that consistent battle for the puck. And by that, I'm not just talking about pushing guys out of the way or physical stuff. I'm talking about battling to see shots from the point, working a little extra harder, being that much more intense and focused. And if you've been listening to this show this summer, you know I've made that reference to Jari, not in a good way, very often. DeSmith has those things. If you could somehow meld the two into some kind of Frankenstein creature, you'd have yourself an A number one goaltender. You can't do that, but you can utilize both of them. And I at least want to float the possibility here that this was and could have been part of the Penguins thinking and saying, listen, we're okay in goal. We might have been okay in goal, in the last playoffs had DeSmith not gotten hurt right at the end of the regular season. When we come back, just one question. Welcome back. It's time for Just One Question. That's always brought to you by... Fubo TV. The monthly cost of cable is over 200 bucks. Fubo TV is just 65 bucks a month. Watch all the same channels, including AT&T Sportsnet Pittsburgh. And for a limited time, Fubo TV is offering our listeners, as in people who listen to this podcast, a seven-day free trial and 15% off your first month. All you got to do is go to FuboTV.com slash DK. One more time, it's FuboTV.com slash DK. Today's question comes from Matthew, who asks, What are your thoughts on sponsors on NHL jerseys? Are there any companies that you might want or don't want to see the Penguins use on theirs? Matthew, I don't have a problem with the NHL having ads on their sweaters. I don't have a problem with the NHL adding ads to the ice surface, to the boards. Really, I hate to say this because I know I'm going to turn a lot of people off, but to almost anything. Understand that the NHL operates at a pretty significant disadvantage when it comes to the other three major professional sports. The obvious reason being that the other three collect way more in TV money. You can debate back and forth as to whether or not that's because the uh, NHL doesn't know how to market its stars, doesn't know how to uh, get rid of some of the goonery, or whether just hockey doesn't translate super effectively to TV. I've always felt it's a little bit more the latter than anything else. I get hockey when I'm watching on TV, and you get hockey when you're watching on TV. That's because you and I are really into it, and you and I have been to a lot of games. We might even have played or refed or coached or taught the game in some ways. I've done all of those. So when we see something on TV, we've already processed all of the translations. Do you see what I'm saying? We're watching something after we've already been converted. We know implied what Mike Matheson did off camera to make that outlet pass to Zach Aston Reese. We already know because we get the game. You can't say the same for somebody just randomly flicking through stations in the heart of Oklahoma. And that, that hurts the NHL. So they don't get the same revenue. And at the same time, they're expected, if you think about it, to be at least somewhat competitive with their salaries and with their other expenditures. And they put so much of the burden from that onto the ticket buyers. The NHL has by far, it's not even close by far the most expensive game tickets in all of sports 
that doesn't help them either, because now it's a somewhat privileged class, generally speaking, that makes it into the NHL arenas across the continent. That hurts too. That hurts the game's growth. So it took the pandemic, I think, to really, really make the NHL aware of that. Because the pandemic kept everybody out and turned all of that in-house revenue to pretty much zero. So what were they going to do? Well, they went to their sponsors and they got a little bit creative. If you have PPG on the side of the helmet, no one's the worse for it. You know, they still don't look like car racers. If you have an ad that's on the the front breast of the sweater, is that really all that different than in 91 and 92 when the Penguins wore patches in those areas? One of them was to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the NHL. Another one was to commemorate the championship from the year before. They also wore one one year right in that same area to commemorate Pittsburgh having the All-Star game. This was way back in 1990, if you want to know how far back I'm reaching with this arcane information. They have had things on that part of the uniform before. It hasn't killed them. They could have something on the shoulder of their uniform and it wouldn't kill them. If you're the avalanche, you'd be replacing that ridiculous Sasquatch footprint. No one would care. I, I just I, I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think it's really much of a debate point. I think it's yet another way that the NHL can equalize the financial landscape that they have and ultimately, again, someday work toward making it easier and more affordable for more people, not just me and you, to get into these arenas and enjoy this beautiful game. I appreciate the question. That's good stuff. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We'll do another one tomorrow. Mm-hmm.